Well, it's an interesting question. How does the mainstream media uh, take a position on GM food? And you have to understand that the health scientists and the science writers in the mainstream media have, uh, have generally come from, <clears throat> you know, some of the better communication schools and they, uh, they have a great confidence in good science, as they should, you know. But that means that they, <clears throat> they would typically uh, respond to maybe six major journals that, that they, they read. And these journals are aware of that, so they they write to these leading American journalists. So the journals are Science, Nature, The Lancet, The British Medical Journal, um, JAMA, The New England Journal of Medicine. Those were the preeminent journals. And um, as soon as they come out with an issue, they send the issue to the major journalists, and that's why those journals get um, the publicity that they get to. And also, when the National Academy comes out with a report, they have a publicity arm of the Academy that gets the attention of the um, science journalists and the health journalists around the country. So that's how the system works. And um, any person who publishes in science journals knows that if they publish an article in one of these six journals, they're going to get publicity. They'll get a feature story in the Times. And if they don't, it's, it's much harder. It's not impossible, but it's much harder. So much of the mainstream media is going to follow what they appears to be the consensus view of the scientific community. And that consensus view comes out of these journals and comes out of the National Academy. So if the consensus view in the United States is that GMOs are perfectly safe, there's no evidence that there's any harm, then that's what's going to be reported in the media. And it takes an enormous amount of um, effort and other kinds of scientific studies to disrupt that position. That's the standard position. And when the National Academy issued its 500-page report in May of 2016. That was basically their position. Even though the report had many nuances, the, made the media picked up on its primary position, which was encapsulated in not the 550 pages, but in one and a half pages that they sent to the major media, which is that there's no difference in the risks from traditional crop breeding to this new form of molecular crop breeding. And that's what the media picked up. So there's a good reason why the mainstream media uh, presents the issues the way they do, because it's coming out of the major um, scientific and medical journals in the United States. They therefore will not pick up on a, on a study published in a in a, in a good journal, but not the leading journal, that says something different. It takes a lot to get their attention to those kinds of issues. So I once did a study of conflicts of interest policies in journals. And um, after the study was done, I pitched the study to one of these six major journals. I thought, 
it needed to get attention. And I couldn't get at least one of the major journals to take it. They didn't even send it out for review. So uh, my colleague and I published it in a bioethics journal, which is not something that is read by the leading science editors. So I, I sent a preprint of the article to somebody in the New York Times. And she brought it to her editor and she said, we're going we're, we're gonna to do something on this. And the night before it came out, she called me up and she said, this is a very well-known uh, New York Times reporter. And she said, Dr. Krimsky, you know, we, we think you're, the article is, is really important and good, but we have to ask you, why did you publish it in this journal? In other words, why didn't you publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine or in JAMA, et cetera? And I said to her, and I have, to, I, I have to say, I wasn't totally honest. I wasn't going to tell her I pitched it to another journal. But I did say, this is an article about journals, medical journals. So why would I want to publish it in a medical journal? And she got it immediately. Of course. Well. And it, it got the uh, story in the Times. And it was an important study. But it wouldn't have been accepted as important if it didn't get the imprimatur of a major news source. So it, it's a tricky business. You can have a good study, but if they don't think that it's you know, it's ready for prime time in the major journals, then you might not get any attention. That's how the media works. Yes, I think they were smart enough to realize that the data in the study was very unique. Nobody had ever done it. And that was very valuable data for people to understand. And, um, and you can't always get your data to be published by these six top places. And, uh, but I, I noticed that the media attention you get is directly correlated to whether you can get it published in the top journals. And of course, everybody tries. And then of course, that's why they have such a high rejection rate. And that's why they're considered so good. Because if you reject so many articles, then you're considered the hardest to get into. So it's, it's an interesting cycle. But I respect those journals regardless. Uh, they have high standards, and they should. And um, you know, whenever I get reviewed, uh, I respect the re most of the reviews are, are respectful and honest. And it's, a best, it's, it's the best system we have. It's not perfect, but better to um, to read articles that have gone through reviews because at least other independent voices have looked at it and given uh, their recommendations uh, on the piece. And, and that's, a good, that's a good thing to do. Wow, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of issues in that one question. Um, no, I, I certainly don't think it's the most important agricultural technology that was ever invented. Uh, I think uh, when, uh, when ordinary farmers figured out that they could take a pollen from one plant and put it into a slightly different species and get a crop from it, 
that, that was a pretty powerful technology, very simple, but they discovered it a thousand years ago that they can start crossbreeding plants that produced a cornucopia of new products. Um, and uh, uh, I don't think the public has yet gotten more flavorful, more nutritious um, products from biotechnology than has been achieved for thousands of years through other methods of traditional breeding. None of the products that have been produced, I would consider, are designed to improve the quality of the um, food for consumers. They're designed to help the producers produce, uh, a, a, I don't know, a better yield perhaps to ward off insects or whatever, but certainly not focused on the quality of the food. So my answer is no, it's not the, the greatest technology that's ever been invented. Now, the next question is, is it the way in which we will eventually solve the problem of world hunger? No, <laughs> it's certainly not. Uh, I've been reviewing very carefully the science of yield and how yield is determined and whether or not biotechnology is correlated <coughs> excuse me with higher yield and it's a it's not necessarily correlated with it <clears throat> there are cases where the yield increases and cases where it isn't it's a very iffy prospect Yield largely is affected by environmental factors, where you grow the food, the soil conditions, the water and other conditions. There are situations where yield has improved for a while until the insects have become resistant to the insect resistant crops. And then the yield starts to decline. So there is no systematic increase in yield. And even in this monumental study of the National Academies of Science, they say there's no evidence that this thus far that this technology will solve the world's food crisis. <laughs> it's just not designed to do that. Um, and uh, it's not like, you know, all of a sudden um, producing yields that are, um, you know, uh, unheard of in terms of their prolific uh, character. It's just uh, not something we find yet and may never find with this technology.